Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Kia. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm currently an assistant professor at the UBC School of Social Work. First, I would like to express very sincere and heartfelt gratitude to the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies for the honor of naming me the recipient of the 2020 CAGS ProQuest Distinguished Dissertation Award in the Fine Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities category. I'm truly humbled by this recognition and deeply grateful for the award. I would also like to extend my deepest apologies for not being able to be present with you today, but I'm so thankful for the opportunity to share more about my research and my doctoral journey in this pre-recorded presentation. Before I get started, I did want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, colonially known as the UBC Vancouver campus, as an uninvited guest. Today, I want to give you a very brief overview of my research by discussing the background that served as the rationale for my dissertation on older gay men's healthcare experiences by quickly going over some key findings of my work, and finally by leaving you with some reflections on my process and journey as a doctoral student. I'm going to close this talk with a bit of a description of my current position and program of research and some words for current doctoral students. So why older gay men's healthcare experiences? Older gay men's relationships with healthcare systems and providers tend to be quite complex in light of a number of social and historical factors, including the legacy of the HIV AIDS epidemic. During the 1980s and 1990s, for example, a lot of gay men of this era experienced profound stigma and discrimination by mainstream medical institutions, and many older gay men today who live with memories of this time understandably approach uh, healthcare settings with a great deal of fear and apprehension. Given this context, uh, it's perhaps surprising that few studies uh, have examined the collective healthcare experiences of older HIV negative gay men, as well as aging gay men living with HIV, and that none have prior to my doctoral research explicitly accounted for the potentially salient influence of HIV AIDS history in shaping these experiences. Keeping this context in mind, my study involved qualitative semi-structured interviews with 27 gay men ages 50 and over in Toronto, 16 of whom were living with HIV about their healthcare experiences. I relied on analytical approaches informed by grounded theory, which involves the inductive and iterative collection and analysis of qualitative data to conceptualize the experiences of the men and to also incorporate relevant theoretical frameworks like Foucauldian governmentality and intersectionality to account for the possible role of HIV AIDS history in constructing uh, the experiences of participants. To give you a sense of my key findings, one of the themes I prominently identified in the data was this notion that many of the men in my sample tended to interpret many contemporary mainstream medical services as socio-historical artifacts of the HIV AIDS epidemic and would therefore fear experiencing stigma and discrimination within these systems. For example, the participant I've quoted here mentions his fear of testing positive for HIV based on his past experiences of witnessing a friend navigate hostile medical systems early in the epidemic and the worry that he would be exposed to a similar kind of care today if he were to test positive. Despite the salience of the, of the aforementioned theme, a point of contrast to this idea was that many of the narratives of my participants contained remarkable expressions of resilience and resistance. For example, the men commonly discussed making their gay identities as well as their HIV status visible and explicit in healthcare systems in order to name their experiences of marginalization and demand better care. Uh, the participant I've quoted here, for example, relied on this strategy to secure more humanized and equitable care for himself. This theme really substantiated the significance of older gay men's voices as sources of knowledge for developing healthcare policies and practices 
that account better for uh, their needs and priorities. Findings of my doctoral research now appear in three peer-reviewed journals, including Sexuality Research and Social Policy and the Journal of Homosexuality. I've also presented these insights at numerous peer-reviewed conferences like the 19th ISA World Congress of Sociology. What makes me particularly excited, however, is the potential for my research to inform measures for greater LGBTQ2S inclusivity in healthcare policy and practice addressing the issues of older adults. I couldn't really talk about my process or journey without expressing how grateful I was for connecting with my amazing supervisor, Dr. Lori E. Ross, my committee members, many other brilliant academics, my cohort and community stakeholders. That being said, I should be transparent that I did experience a delay in defending my dissertation for a number of reasons. My plans for postdoctoral employment all virtually fell through at the end of year four uh, when I was initially getting ready to defend. And I realized that I needed to further refine uh, my work to improve my publication record. Finally, given the job market I was beginning to target, I recognized I needed more teaching experience. I used the additional year of my PhD to address these gaps. I should also mention that there were many personal challenges along the way that very much complicated the process, including the illness of a very close family member. On a happier note, uh, I did finally graduate and uh, I accepted a tenure track position as assistant professor at the UBC School of Social Work in November 2018. My position officially started in July 2019. My current program of research addresses sexual and gender minority health, social work and other professional practice with SGM communities and the issues and experiences of SGM older adults among other themes. I want to end with some brief reflections for current doctoral students. First and foremost, I want to emphasize that so-called non-traditional non trajectories are very much the norm in academia. And I guess my hope for PhD students is for folks to go easy on themselves if personal challenges delay their goals for degree completion, um, you know, in the timeline that they had originally envisioned, for example. My second thought is to emphasize to students that their work is absolutely presentable and or publishable. I say and or because I know in some disciplines publishing may not always be an option. Trust your voice and your ability to address gaps in the scholarship because I really think that building an academic identity through your writing is absolutely critical for a success. And since you are in a PhD program, you are by definition capable of contributing in this way. Third, uh, seek out and secure a support network that includes peers, mentors, as well as people completely outside the academy. I know that in my case, I especially couldn't have made it through without all of the support in my life. And last but not least, be kind to yourself. Um, this is such a difficult and challenging process and having compassion for yourself, I think, goes a very long way. Um, thanks so much for listening. And thank you again to the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies for the honor of allowing me to share in this space today. Thank you.